Coming up on episode 15 of the R Podcast, we take a closer look at the Shiny package for developing interactive web applications using basically just R code. I'll talk about some of the little nuggets of information I've learned in developing Shiny applications, and I'm also going to share some excellent resources and showcases from the community on just what the kind of power you can achieve with Shiny itself. So this is episode 15. Are you ready for the R podcast? Hi everyone, welcome back to episode 15 of the R Podcast. Luckily, the time in between this and the last episode was not two years like it was before. Um, But anyway, it's been an interesting holiday break. I've been able to get some things done, but I'll touch on one effort that unexpectedly uh, took a turn in terms of of this uh, podcast. But I hope all of you had a great holiday break or are still enjoying it. And that you've had some good relaxation time and hopefully some time to play with some cool R things. So one thing that you may notice if you visited the site before I before listening to this episode is it looks a bit different now. Um, so I, I referenced in episode 14 that I was in the process of getting ready to migrate the kind of the backbone of the R podcast site from using WordPress over to a more uh, static site generator called Nicola. Well, I've been kind of doing this slowly but surely as I've gotten time, but of course when you see one morning that your site is giving this very cryptic um, web server error, and I put all the Linux troubleshooting skills I had to test, and I still could not figure out why my site just suddenly stopped rendering. So. That kind of put a little needle in my backside, so to speak, to get this thing migrated full time so you could actually access the content again. Um, so I'm happy to say that by the time you're listening to this, if, if not a bit sooner, that the new version of the site is live. It's the same URL as before at www.r-podcast.org. But now it is using, like I mentioned, this um, new framework called Nicola to generate the content. What's really interesting about this framework is I'm able to write all the posts and you know static links, like the you know most of the most of like the resource page and the things like that. I'm able to write all that using Markdown format which makes my life a lot easier because I write Markdown all the time for when I do like interactive reports or I touched on in the last episode with R. Um, But what's really interesting about this is apparently I'm not the only one that thought about the potential of writing content for a site like this from within the R itself because there's an excellent post that I'll link to in the show notes from Edward Baraski, um, for I think he did this a year or two ago, he wrote a nice tutorial on how you can basically create a blog yourself with R Studio and Nicola. Um, now I'm aware you can do other frameworks as well, like the Jekyll framework with GitHub is a very popular combination. And frankly, you could achieve most of this um, what I, what I'm doing with Nicola for those as well. I think what I like about Nicola is I feel like I have a little more control over the configuration and also it's kind of been an interesting way for me to finally get a little bit more familiar with Python because that's what is the whole Nicola source is based on. And while I'm still very much a Python novice, it's kind of given me a little bit of insight in how it treats like data structures that are somewhat similar to how R treats things, but I still have obviously a long ways to go. And obviously for my data analysis needs and for most of the podcasts, it's still going to be 
about R anyway. Um, but like I said, it's been an interesting experience. But what I've also liked is I've been able to get in touch with the uh, developers and other contributors to the project very easily. And actually, they helped me fix some of the key issues I've had in migrating the content over, mainly getting the feed set up correctly so that you can put the feed in like your favorite podcatching software and be able to get the actual episodes. So while I'm still having a little bit of issues getting a different audio format properly um, in the in the right feed, you'll still be able to get the default feed much like before. It's just a slightly different URL. Um, but as as with the previous version of the site, I am obviously aggregating the content with our bloggers because I realize most of you probably use that site to to see any updates to the R podcast site itself. But over time, I will be putting some more dedicated articles that maybe go more in depth on a topic on some more technical level that doesn't lend itself as as nicely with just the typical audio format of the podcast. And just having this framework done now will make my life a lot easier to maintain the site because I basically have full control of everything and I don't rely on databases to keep track of things like WordPress does. So, again, this isn't a knock on WordPress because it obviously got me started doing this in general, but it's certainly been a now that I've learned a few things along the way in terms of administering websites that Nicola gives me a, a much more optimal framework and kind of keeps some of the cruft that you might get with a WordPress installation out of the way. So, and then as I was doing this migration around the same time, now we can get as end users, we can get what are called SSL certificates absolutely free which basically enables your site to have that nice HTTPS, you know, part of the address. And it, it's just a nice little verification that the content you're seeing is indeed from me and not some kind of phishing site trying to imitate my site. So I, I link in the show notes to, initi to an initiative called Let's Encrypt that basically is a partnership, I believe, with the Linux Foundation to let anybody who's putting a site online get what's called SSL encryption absolutely free. And to me, I think it's a, a big win for security in general. And obviously you could use this for any type of site, no matter if it's WordPress or like what I'm doing over Nicola or just any other little static site you have. So so again, uh, the r-podcast.org site looks a bit different. But I think it's a good thing, and I'll be making some more cosmetic tweaks here and there. But as always, please provide me any feedback if you miss certain features, but I'm hoping to get most of everything back up in working order by the time you're listening to this. So with that little administrative update out, out of the way, let's dive into our main topic, a little bit of introduction to developing applications with Shiny. Okay, so I'm hoping if you're listening to this, and most of you at least briefly have heard about Shiny before, and this podcast will not so much introduce every basic concept, but I'm going to provide you know pointers to the official resources and some other helpful resources if you're just getting started. So since Shiny has been produced by the team at our studio, they've done a really good good um, job on documentation for basically everything about the package. And it's been really a great um, resource for me, especially as I get up, to, get up to speed on either new concepts or just brushing up on some of the Shiny basics. So I will link to the official Shiny portal in the show notes, as well as a link to some of the webinars our studio has done that do some really nice introductions um, to Shiny and some of the concepts behind that. So I think that would be a great uh, companion resource for you to listen to or watch in addition to what I'm talking about here. Um, I've also seen rather recently that one of the more uh, now more prominent kind of Shiny community members named Dean Atelli 
has done this great tutorial on his blog on getting started with Shiny. It's a real kind of practical approach and it really introduces some of the key concepts in a nice building fashion. And he also highlights some of the concepts that can give some people trouble that admittedly have given me trouble in the past um, in terms of grasping right away. Um, in fact, I'll touch on one of those concepts now. Um, one of the real nice features of Shiny in general is the concept of reactivity, which if you're familiar with, you know, putting formulas in a spreadsheet application, you can, you know, get a column of numbers and then you make another column be like some kind of transformation of that. And then whenever you update a cell in like the first column, the transform column gets automatically updated. So that's so most spreadsheets give you this functionality right away. But in terms of base R itself, that's not always the case because if you have a vector that you define right off the bat of like X of being numbers one through five and you do a, a summation of that, if you try to change something but you don't save that object back as X, then you're not going to see those updates. So you gotta be a little careful there. But what, what Shiny does with reactivity is whenever a user changes something in the user interface, or it could even be a different trigger than this, that any things that depend on that input, like maybe a plot or a summary table or things like that, will automatically get updated without you having to rerun that object being created. It'll basically do the rerunning for you. And you do have to be somewhat careful in how you reference reactive objects, which I've often seen this error of you trying to access something without a react in a reactive context, but not being in the right, you know, situation, so to speak, that's obviously more technical than that. But I would definitely brush on the reactivity resources that are on the official Shiny portal that kind of get you a little baseline on how the concepts work. Because again, even as I've been de developing Shiny apps for over about a couple of years now, that concept still kind of trips me up if I'm not careful. Um, some of the other things I've picked up along the way is when you're developing the user interface, and typically you put this, if you're doing what we call the two file layout, you can put all the user interface code in a special file called UI.R. Um, you do have, there's also other ways you can, you can format a Shiny application in terms of the files. But what I've noticed when I'm creating the user interface elements is since you're basically kind of creating almost like different functions pieced together within a big function, there are almost like special parameters inside a big function. And what I mean by that is you almost always have to separate things with commas. So if you're doing an element of your user interface, like a select panel or select input, I should say, and then afterwards you want a text input, maybe after that you've got a file upload. You've got to be careful not to have any missing commas as you, as you put these elements in, because that's probably the biggest error I always have when I develop these applications is I'm missing one comma somewhere and it gives me what can look like a cryptic message. But then when I look at the user interface, I see, oh geez, I missed one comma in this particular block of the user elements. And it's just one of those things that if you're, using an editor that gives you some kind of syntax like checking like the newer versions of our studio it usually will pick some of this stuff up for you but um, it still can be easy to miss so it's always worth a look to make sure that you have separated things out correctly um, I've also noticed that when you get to things such as um, the back-end processing, like in the server.r file, if you're doing the two-file layout, a lot of the functions within that that you can use, such as the typical reactive function, they allow you to supply basically a whole bunch of R code that's encapsulated in the squiggly brackets. Again, it's probably more 
technical term for that. That's what I call them. Um, but you have to make sure that if you're putting this more complex block of code, that you're either outputting the resulting object or having a return statement afterwards or at the end of the function at the of the block, if you will, so that the rest of the function knows what the output of that whole block is. So sometimes I've created like a bunch of objects in this in this um, portion of say the reactive uh, function, and then I forgot to either just call the name of my last object I wanted to have available, or I forgot to do a return statement if I was doing a more complex type of output object. So that's one thing to keep in mind. And then even getting back to the user interface type functions for, for a second here, what's interesting is that if you follow like the examples in each of the functions documentation, like select input or things like that, when you actually write, you know, write out, say your select input call in the R console and, and e execute it, you're actually going to see the HTML code that that produces. And so it's kind of a reminder that really what you're doing with the user interface elements is you're, they're basically nice wrappers to HTML type code. And if you ever have a question on what this really looks like when you're going to produce a Shiny application, it's really nice just to be able to run that in real time just to see what that kind of stuff looks like. Um, and then also um, keeping on the user interface th theme, you'll often see a lot of the tutorials or the initial articles about Shiny use what are what's called the sidebar layout, which if you haven't seen that before, that's where most of your user elements are on the left. And then in this kind of what they call well panel, it's just basically like your left hand margin of a site. And then the, the rest of the site, you might call that like the body of the site, is where you put your various placeholders for your output objects. Like you could do a summary table, you could do a plot, you could do all sorts of stuff, even just verbatim type text output. So in my experience, the sidebar layout has been good for when you have applications that have relatively few user interface controls so that you can line them up pretty nicely in the sidebar and not have to scroll very much. And also, if you have at least relatively few output containers, and even if you have more output containers, you can do what's called the tab layout, and you can have different tabs at the top of this body to separate out the different you know portions of output. So you might have one tab that's more dedicated to visualization, maybe another tab that's more tabular in nature, you know, or even another tab that's like what what a lot of websites do when they have like an about page. You could do like a, a central place for documentation on how to use your application. So that's one other feature. Um, but what I've noticed is that if you have a lot more user interface elements and some may be needed in certain parts of the interface and others aren't, um, and when I develop these more complex applications in practice, I've used what's called the grid layout system. That's where you have much more granular control in terms of do you want your user interface elements like as one big row in your user interface at the top or the bottom? Do you want multiple columns in your user interface, you know, layout? Things like that. You get you get you get the control all that and it still keeps it in a somewhat responsive fashion. Although you could use an option to make it more of a fixed margin length or length or width, but I've used what's more the dynamic um, layout where when you resize your browser, it kind of makes things still play nicely in the in the new size of your window. Um, so I, I do link to the official article about laying your application out with Shiny in the, in the show notes, but I had. I have one pretty complex application at work that's made extensive use of the grid function, or the grid layout, I mean, where I had some parts of the user interface be literally just rendering a data table and then putting some diagnostic information below it. 
and I didn't need like user elements on the left because that was taken care of in another tab. And also for plots, I, it was a good way for me to control having some plots side by side versus stacked. So you, like I said, you get a lot of flexibility with this. Um, and I mentioned in the last episode that coming up at the end of January is the Shiny Developer Conference. And well, knock on wood, I'll still be attending that. Um, but one of the things I hear there's going to be a talk about is maybe some newer ways of laying out your application using a newer version of this grid system. So I'm really interested to see what that's about. Um, but it's nice that if you have a simple app, the sidebar layout kind of gives you what you need and gets out of your way for you to kind of make more, more um, concentrate more on what your application is doing. But like I said, for more complex applications, I've used the grid layout in combination with what are called navigation bar pages and as well as the tabs within each of those pages, if you will. So it's like a, a double nesting or some of the tutorials that our studios then calls it like a, a way you stack your application as if it was like this big pile. Um, that's probably a terrible analogy. But anyway, that I've used that for some of my more complex applications. Um, I would say the other part that I've learned is debugging with Shiny takes a bit more effort than it does with typical R applications because in typical R code, you're able to kind of see everything that's happening within your workspace when you dive in using like the browser function or using traceback and things like that. Sometimes things aren't quite as transparent when you're debugging shiny applications, but you're still able to put little triggers to, to basically trigger the debugger in like some of your server processing. Like if you're creating a reactive data frame, you could put a browser call in that somewhere. And then if you're running this either in the command line or in RStudio, you'll get the console pop up at that particular point and you can do some inspection to see what's happening. Um, that's probably been the technique that's helped me the most, but I am hearing that there might be some more optimal techniques that are talked about at the developer conference that... Hopefully I can learn some newer ways of debugging to make things a little easier. But frankly, a lot of my errors are either because I didn't separate things out with commas in the user interface, or I goofed up in terms of having a missing bracket or a missing parenthesis somewhere, and then everything goes kaput after that. Um, so syntax has probably been my biggest enemy in terms of learning this in, in the beginning. But now I'm starting to get the hang of it more. And like I said, something like our studio itself, the, the IDE, has newer features that kind of make it easy to find where you've mistyped something or misspelled or have a missing bracket. Um, so I would definitely take advantage of those features. But a lot of those features are also available in some other IDEs that you might use, like maybe Eclipse or... Heck, if you're really adventurous using Vim or Emacs for it too. Um, but that's another story for another day. Um, so one of the other things I wanted to touch on is it's one thing to kind of read through the tutorials that you have on the, the official Shiny portal. But it's another thing to actually see how other people are using these skills to produce some really innovative applications. So I'll have links to within the official Shiny um, documentation, they have their own official gallery that's more geared towards a particular concept and how you build a simple app that demonstrates that. So it's nice if you want to kind of see an example of a very specific thing, like um, there's, there's some topics on using data tables and some other things with interactive plots that I'll get to in a little bit. Um, but what I've also benefited from is actually seeing shiny applications in the wild, so to speak. So they do have a user showcase linked in the shiny portal that gives you some idea of how some applications have been built more for like teaching or more for real time kind of data processing, you know, some that are more like a catalog of other concepts. So 
definitely check out the source code behind those apps if it's available for you to kind of get a good layout on how things work. But there was one particular application that when I saw it for the first time, I was basically completely blown away. So I'll link um, to an application called Radiant. Radiant is um, produced by a shiny developer named, named Vincent. Um, I'll probably butcher his last name, but uh, <laughs> Vincent Nijus? <laughs> that's, that's terrible. Um, I'm sorry, Vincent, if you're listening to this. But anyway, um, it's been a really interesting um, application because he has basically created an R package itself called Radiant that does a lot of the backend server processing that the various user elements of his application let the user basically choose or process. And it, it reminds me of if you were, te I think he does it for a, a course that he teaches, but it is a wonderful way to learn statistics and be able to kind of see what interactive things he can do with plots or just typical summary functions. Um, he's done an excellent job with this. And I don't know if I'm, I'm hoping to get to talk with him if he's attending the uh, developer conference. So hopefully if you're listening to this, we'll, we'll be in touch. But I've just been really blown away of how he organized everything and his, his model for organizing the code in various files and kind of sourcing them in different places is a nice way for making the maintenance of a complex application slightly easier and hopefully to be able to trace where certain issues are occurring without having, say, one big user interface file or one big server file that has maybe thousands of lines of code, but it splits things up in a nice kind of compartmentalized fashion. But I've been, one of the features that he really um, did a good job with that I'm trying to emulate in some other ways is the concept of saving the state of your application and be able to restore that at a later time if you have to leave or, or shut down for a bit. So the way he does it is he has a function or a set of functions, and certainly more than one, that will let that will basically capture all what the inputs were set at in the user session and let the user download it as a special R workspace file. And then upon the re-execution of an app, the user can simply upload this R workspace file and have everything restored the way it was before they, they quit the application. Um, so this is, this is huge, especially in the case where if you have an application like his or some others where there's so much to do in it that you might not get to everything in your first try and you kind of want to, and if you have to interrupt your work or something, you don't want to have to reload all your data sets or re analyze certain variables you want all that ready to go for next time so his approach is something i'm trying to emulate with some more complex applications at work where i might be able to find a way to have the user have a list of their previous sessions and be able to simply restore one of them at any point and pick up where they left off so i would i would definitely check out the radiant application um, and I have a link to the official kind of portal he made for documentation on there in the show notes. But it's really a, an excellent showcase on a lot of things you can do. Um, there's even a way that you can deploy the application yourself on your own premises. But he also has hosted the three different versions of the application on the uh, shinyapps.io service that's provided by our studio. So you don't have to install anything to just play with it. So like I said, that's that's a great one to keep in mind. Um, and on this on this topic of keeping up with developments in the community, I would definitely recommend um, doing some maybe daily or even just weekly reading of the official Shiny Discuss mailing list. It's a simple kind of Google mailing list, but many of the Shiny core developers and others in the community are frequent contributors to questions and answers on, on that mailing list. And 
over time, I see little nuggets of certain things that other people are doing that I bookmark for later because it may be something I want to try in some applications later on. Like I recall, there was a post about somebody that's trying to put, make it so that within using what's called the Docker framework to be able to kind of auto deploy applications on the spot using containers. And so that's more for kind of a, a sysadmin or system administration type setup. But boy, that's an interesting app way of tying a lot of key, you know, newer Linux concepts together. Um, but there's also obviously some deep dives into other topics like using data tables effectively and some and then also put um, links or, or updates or announcements whenever they do a new version of the shiny package so people have a chance to test things out. So it's a, it's a great way to kind of keep up to date with the community. And of course, as I always mention in many of the episodes, keeping a, a close reading on rbloggers.com, you often see quite a few posts about people um, showcasing some shiny applications or demonstrating various concepts via tutorials. So I would definitely keep those uh, resources in mind when you um, want to talk, when you want to keep up to date with what's going on with Shiny. So there are a couple newer features that have been built into Shiny recently that I'm keeping a close eye on. One that came about, what was it, three or four months ago, or maybe maybe earlier, hard to tell, is the concept of making either a, a plot you create using base R functions or a plot you create with ggplot2 to have some automatic interactive capabilities. And I'll, I'll link to um, the articles that Shiny, the, the Shiny team has made in the show notes where you can do certain things like brushing to basically, if you have a scatter plot, you could use your mouse to select certain points using, you know, either clicking them or making what's called a brush, like making a, a square that's when you're dragging your mouse from like up to down. And you could actually see via maybe another data table, the kind of points you've, you've actually, you know, selected. You can also use that for basically a custom zooming of, of your plot. That's really helpful to me because sometimes I'll deal with a lot of skewed distribution data and I'm not as interested in kind of the outliers to the tails of the distribution. I'd rather just have the user select where the, where the most common points are. So the concept of brushing is a great way to to pull that off without you having to do a lot of work yourself to build a custom user element for that. So that's all part of the official Shiny package. So you don't have to install anything else. But I think using that in combination with ggplot2 can give you some really interesting things to, to try out. And I'm going to be trying that out in some of the applications I make, both for at my work, but also even just some of the applications I make for, for fun as well. And speaking of interactions with, with plots, um, recently the uh, Plotly framework was open sourced by the Plotly team, where I think I touched on this in an earlier episode, but what's nice about this framework is now that it's open source, there's an R package that will let you interact with Plotly directly and not have to upload certain parts of your plotting content to their custom service. You can keep all that on your local area, you know, local network. But there is some preliminary efforts to offer some interactivity with Shiny applications as well. And while this is more newer than the, um, the, the interactivity that the Shiny team has built within the package itself, this might have some interesting use cases if Plotly does something different than a typical plot you would do in base R or ggplot2. So I would that's something I want to play with as well and seeing how that compares and contrasts with the interactive plots you can do with with Shiny built in. But those are kind of some of the things I've learned along the way and what I'm doing to keep up with new newer developments and how I'm trying to learn with from others in the Shiny community that 
have done some really good shiny applications um, so that I can take some concepts and put those in my applications in the future. Um, up, so that about covers my, um, my dive into an introduction to Shiny. Up next, let's get into our, our community roundup. So for this edition of our R Community Roundup, I want to highlight a newer, I won't, I'm not sure how, I, I always hate to say newer because it's really not that new, but it's more newer to me. Um, this interesting framework of bringing web or JavaScript utilities for our users. Um, this concept is called HTML widgets. And what, what they are is basically, it's a, HTML widgets itself is an R package, but it gives you kind of a, a grounding point to develop more custom widgets that take an existing JavaScript type library and make it so that you can call certain pieces of that library, or heck, all of it, using just R code. It's kind of like what Shiny has done with more typical web application framework. But now it's doing the same kind of thing for more of these custom widgets that you see in some of the newer sites that you might visit online. So one thing that's been interesting to watch over the course of this year is the HTML widgets blog, which I'll link to in the show notes where the author, um, I believe his name is Kent Russell, he has done um, basically each week of the year he's converted or at least attempted to convert an existing JavaScript framework that could be used via an HTML widget in R and of course with Shiny as well. And this was a way that I discovered some really interesting widgets that have benefited some of the applications I'm doing lately. Two of which, or one of which in particular, is called Diagrammer. I'm not sure if he calls a diagram R or diagram R. Um, it's a similar idea. But what, what's nice is that it wraps this JavaScript utility to create really intricate or even simple, you know, flow diagrams or, you know, tree diagrams, however you want to call it, and have it so that it's a nice HTML widget that you can interact with. And this package kind of goes above and beyond the typical widget because the author has built in this nice kind of custom object processing for building your attributes a, a, that are associated with like a node in your overall network diagram along with attributes associated with like the edges that connect those nodes together. But when I saw this, I was thinking I, I need to use this some of my stuff at work because I'm doing some applications with Shiny that are going to visualize certain pathways or networks transitions from like one starting point to another and there may be multiple destination nodes based on its parent node and to be able to dynamically change some of those while interacting with Shiny is, is really helpful. So a lot of these HTML widgets will have the capability of using it in just a base R session but also a couple special functions that you use for your user interface or special output containers for a Shiny application so you get that same effect. So many of the applications that um, Ken has worked on have, have, do some of those interactivity with Shiny as well as just base R. Um, and then also he had one that was more later on called Sweet Alerter could be sweet alert R, I'm not sure how to say it, but it was a nice way for you to, to take a JavaScript utility that puts some more user-friendly styling among when you get like one of those custom alerts that pop up on, your, on a website that looks like this very basic text box, but he's got in such a way where it looks kind of nice and glossy and, and pleasing looking using some nicer HTML5 type styling. So I was looking at that and then I had actually provided some feedback to him about, hey, I think this would be really cool to use in um, 
a Shiny application. And so I was thinking, is there a way I can combine this with another um, package that is not so much an HTML widget, but it's a, a great thing to keep an eye on um, called Shiny.js. Shiny.js is also by Dean Atelli, but it, what he's done is he noticed that he was doing a lot of custom JavaScript code within his applications and he decided to just put some friendly wrappers around certain things so that all of us could benefit from it in addition to making his life easier it sounds like. So he's able to do some interesting things like showing or hiding elements pretty easily, changing colors of certain elements, um, there's not just scratches the surface, there's a lot more he can you can do with that. But I had some nice interactions on the um, on the Sweet Alerter issue list on GitHub with how I could put this in a Shiny app and both uh, Dean and Ken were very helpful in giving me some code to to, autom to basically make this as easy as possible so that if I have an application that if the user selects something wrong or d misses a step that it would be very obvious as an alert to pop up and alert them that hey wait a minute you forgot this step but have it in such a way that it's much easier to look at than just the typical kind of text type layout that you get in some of these alerts. So I thought that was that was an interesting uh, dialogue with them and I'm hoping I can talk with them more in the future as they, they develop some more interesting frameworks or they keep extending things like Shiny JS and these various um, HTML widgets that are that are coming up much more in popularity now. But this whole concept of widgets in general I think is pretty important because I've seen various presentations from the RStudio um, Shiny developers that you know what they've done with Shiny is kind of give this foundation for your application itself but in terms of extending things they it seems like the big picture is going to be being able to kind of pick and choose these different widgets and put them all within your application in a nice concise way so I'm so that's why I'm kind of trying to learn how these how these widgets work while getting a somewhat somewhat basic knowledge of JavaScript, although, like I said, as, a, as an end user, you're not required to know JavaScript to use these various widgets. It's only if you were developing something custom that you might want to dive into this. So that's something that's, you know, as I continue to learn about web technologies in general that I'm keeping an eye on for the future. But that's just some of my uh, thoughts on the our community and we respect the shiny and web development in general. So up next is our package pick. So for the package pick this week, um, it's actually touching on a concept of, of unit testing within R. And while I could easily say it's the test that package, um, I'm hoping mostly you already have heard of that package, but that is the, um, the package created by Hadley Wickham that lets you basically create unit tests in a very logical and easy to understand way within R itself. So most of the time that suits your needs, but there may be a case where if you're developing a package that interacts with some kind of web API or some kind of source that you don't always have access to, but you want to create some kind of mock structure to test with, there's a newer package called stub that that basically provides what are called stubs that you can use while unit testing an, an R itself. So he says while you're not required to use it with test that, it does have some nice integrations with test that so that as you're building these tests, you might make what's called a stub that, that mimics what your what kind of web data you're trying to obtain with your with your package. Because a lot of the packages these days are interacting with certain web APIs so that we don't have to 
copy paste a lot of stuff from a web page table or things like that to be able to interact with with the data in a real time way. So admittedly, I haven't had a chance to play with stub that yet. But as I in the future create any R packages that deal with some kind of API, whether it's a web API or even a local service that's on a system, I'll definitely keep this in mind to help structure or augment my automated test a bit easier. So I, w I have a link to stub that, um, the GitHub repo in the show notes, as well as a, a post from Stack Overflow on what exactly a stub means in, in terms of automated testing. So with the package pick done, let's do a quick recap of the latest news. So the news has been a little bit light um, in, in respect to the holiday break, which is expected, right? A lot of us are resting and taking some much needed time off. But this came through rather recently is there is now a new version of ggplot2. It's version 2.0.0, which seems pretty appropriate. Um, and of course, ggplot2 is arguably one of the most popular frameworks for creating visualizations in R. And I would definitely invite you to check out some of my previous episodes on ggplot2 if you want a more basic inter inter introduction, as well as a screencast I created that shows you how to do some basic box plots or histograms and things like that. Um, but apparently the, the biggest motivation was um, that Hadley Wickham, of course, the author of ggplot2, is making a second edition of his very um, popular um, ggplot2 textbook. And in the process of making this new edition, he's found a lot of issues that have been nagging at him that he wanted to fix once and for all. And so he's basically done that in version two. So I have some experts from the um, Art Studio blog post that highlights the release in the show notes. The one feature that I'm keeping a very close eye on and I want to play with is that now ggplot2 has an extension um, capability, which means that we can, as end users, create some more custom stats, you know, geomes or other frameworks and provide them in other packages so that basically ggplot2 can now be like a foundation that we can kind of make plugins for, if you if you will, that don't necessarily reinvent all ggplot2, but just take some capabilities of it and maybe tweak them a certain way, or like like maybe add some newer capabilities, um, because it sounds like ggplot2 in terms of newer development may be stabilizing more and more. So to produce some really novel interactions, we probably should take advantage of this um, extension capability. So I've also linked to the um, the vignette that Hadley wrote on extending ggplot2 um, for more details on how that works, as well as the rest of the release notes from the GitHub page, because there's a lot more general fixes on certain stats and also some geomes, as well as some deprecation, deprecation of certain things that if you have some existing ggplot2 code in a production type application or, or analysis, you'll want to keep an eye on that in case you need to update anything. Um, so yeah, that's that's um, definitely the biggest event I saw recently. So I think with that, we're going to wrap things up here. Um, so as always, if you would like to provide feedback on the show, you can either email me at the rcast at gmail.com. You can also use the uh, contact page on the RPAC, our podcast website. It should look very close to what you saw before. Um, and you can also leave a voicemail on the, uh, the voicemail hotline. That's uh, plus one, two, six, nine, eight, four, nine, nine, seven, eight, zero. And uh, as I'm launching this effort again, I've, gotten some great feedback already on some future topics to pursue and I'm hoping to also get some interaction with some other members of the community um, in terms of some joint efforts down the road. 
So it's really exciting to be back doing this um, on a more regular basis. And while I hope to do another episode before the developer conference, um, it may be such that the next episode is a, a wrap up of the conference with hopefully some great interviews as well. We shall see. Um, if you want to keep up to date with things, I would definitely bookmark the website or put it, the RSS feed in your favorite uh, feed aggregating software to keep up to date with the latest and greatest of the efforts. So that's going to do it for episode 15 of the R podcast. Until next time. End of line.